time to dive deep. Deep dive time. Deep. Deep dive. So we're on climate change part three. Initially, I was thinking we were going to do just three parts on climate change. We had a talk yesterday. It's looking like five at least now. Minimum. <laughs> Might be doing this for another month and a half. Honestly, we could. Um, I do like becoming like a real expert in things. So yeah. I am and down. If you're going to be an expert in anything, climate is the most important thing to be an expert on. Yes. Right? I mean, like this is the thing that matters more than all other things. Absolutely. Absolutely. More than the China competition, more than workers' rights and everything. Climate is the one. Yeah. I mean, in fact, in a lot of those things in the China competition and in workers' rights, we've already seen based on our conversations, they, part of their importance is because they're integrated into the fight against climate change. This is the theme that is underscoring every single policy conversation in the world right now. Climate change is affecting every policy conversation, every geopolitical competition. Everything is revolving around whether or not we're going to save the planet or not. I'm, I'm smiling just because we just stacked intensity of like how hard we talked about that. <laughs> um, but yeah, hopefully you get the point. It's an important thing. Today we're talking, so the last two episodes, we've talked about the science of climate change and like specifically what kind of effects we're seeing, why it is so scary. Today, we're going to start to get into the fight against it. And we're starting in the shift in our energy generation, right? So for climate change, there are a few main contributors of the greenhouse gas emissions that have put us in this situation higher than anything is energy production for homes and for industry, okay? So how is the transition currently looking as we try to shift to renewables and clean energy sources? What is standing in the way? How can we move forward faster? That's what we're looking at. So as a little bit of a background, historically, energy demand has tracked with GDP and population growth as countries have more money to spend on energy, right? So they have more money to spend on energy and that energy makes them more productive, which of course gives them even more money to spend on energy. And that virtuous cycle continues and continues. And we've seen that in the US, several other Western countries, and now more recently in China and other developing countries as they scale up. Yes, it used to be the case, or maybe you'll argue it still is the case, that energy production was the ticket to a higher GDP. But what we've seen in a lot of the developed world, Europe and the United States, that doesn't have to be the case anymore. No. We have now seen a reduction. We can see economic growth with the reduction of carbon emissions. They are no longer tied. They are no longer corollary factors. Yes. They are no longer related. It's, we have totally decoupled them. It's the result of shifting to a service economy. I think we would both agree. Definitely. Um, because once you're going into a manufacturing economy, you need more energy. Those are more energy intensive tasks. Um, as we move forward now, we're in a really pivotal stage because those manufacturing tasks are probably going to be shifting out of China into other developing countries, first and foremost, India, mm -hmm. right? And we're hoping that energy demand will be flattening because of increases in energy efficiency for not only for appliances, but also shifts to clean energy for those countries. Right. Okay. So what's going on with clean energy? What's our progress? We don't have a ton of progress right now. Still in the US, I think maybe I don't even have these numbers. Do you have these numbers on how on what percentage of our energy has been generated cleanly? I, I, Move on, I'll find the number. Okay, thank you. I'll find it quick. Um, really what I focus more on here is the cost of different energy sources, the economics of it. And the truth is, the economics say that we should be using way more clean energy than we are. In the past 10 years, the price of electricity from solar declined by 89%. The cost of electricity from onshore wind decreased 70%. Costs have, incre have decreased this much compared to other sources because renewable energy sources don't have to be dig up, dug up and then burned, right? It's much simpler than that. They just come to the source. The wind comes to the turbine. The sun comes and shines on the solar panel. So the cost of the technology is what drives the cost of producing energy. And solar power specifically has become so cheap because they started being produced at a very high price point for a very specific purpose. And this was because 
they were necessary in space. When the U.S. and the Soviet Union were first going to space in the 50s and the 60s, they had the sun as the easiest, most accessible source of energy. So they built these solar panels that were really expensive and there were very few use cases for them. But as they started to build more, the cost of building them started to go down. As the cost of building them started to go down, it started to become more viable to use them for other projects. And this virtuous cycle continued enough to create this learning effect of solar, which basically means the relationship between modules produced and price. And this learning effect for solar is staggering. Each doubling of installed cumulative capacity decreases the price of a solar cell by 20.2%, wow. which is so much more than comparable sources. It's the most of any energy source. Wind has a learning rate of um, of about 20 or about 18%, I think. Yeah, it looks like about 18%. Um, and meanwhile, these other these other sources like coal has not has almost barely changed in price at all over the same amount of time uh oil is a completely fluctuating oil and gas are completely fluctuating prices because they're dominated by a few major exporting countries that can just control supply and thus demand at will right these renewable sources are much safer and more secure source of energy. One point that I'm going to point out here is nuclear prices, because unlike solar and wind, nuclear prices have actually gone up. Why is that? One, because it's been regulated more heavily. Yeah. We've had these massive nuclear disasters in Chernobyl and Fukushima. that has made everyone super scared about nuclear energy. So as regulations have gone up. It's become a lot more costly to go through the regulation processes and build these projects. And two, countries haven't standardized its productions, so it hasn't felt the benefit of those learning effects as much. Countries that have standardized its production have seen massive decreases in its price. Yeah, and you can see that, that perfect example is in France, right? Exactly. France is the key of nuclear energy. They're yeah. Almost their entire electricity grid, if not their entire electric grid, is totally done through nuclear power. Exactly. It's one of the reasons that they weren't really uh, hit by the Russian oil shock during the Ukrainian invasion because they weren't relying on Russian gas and Russian oil. Mm -hmm. um, I have the numbers that we were talking about here. So, Amazing. Yes. Yeah, so the fossil fuels of the United States uh, fund uh, the United... Uh, okay. Hey, let's go here. Energy... Ugh. It's hard. I'm so dumb. Dude, it's just hard. Bro. Yeah. Sometimes it's hard to make sentences like work. Yeah. We you have like this? so much information that we've been figuring out that's swimming around, I feel like. Yes. It's hard to construct it. Okay. So 60% of our energy comes from fossil fuels. 40% of that is natural gas. Okay. 20% of it is coal. Okay. 20% of our energy comes from nuclear. Okay. And then 21.5% comes from renewables, 10% being wind, six being hydropower, and three is solar. That's impressive. That's and it more goes than down, I expected. Down more. And that's kind of the story I actually want to tell because I think it's more impressive than some of us give credit for. Yeah. Um, if we go to different states, we can see different things being more successful than others. Texas is one state that is actually very successful with a lot of its renewable energy development. So it has 46% of its energy coming from natural gas, 18% coming from coal, but 23% coming from wind. 2% wow. coming from solar. But what that tells me is there is so much more room to grow in Texas. The fact that they're already at 23, 25% renewable with 23% wind and only 2% solar already at 25% renewable. If they get that solar solar number up, they're already above the national average Yeah, for renewable development, right? Yeah. So that's already awesome to see. That and that's in Texas. Impressive. That's in ruby red Texas we're talking about. Totally, totally. We, we might not have talked about this before, but a lot of the... Inflation Reduction Act incentives are probably going to go to red states. Most of it goes to red states. Yeah, that are building out these projects because a lot of them are the ones that are hardest hit by climate change, like in the South, um, and they need more energy security. Yeah. These sources can give them that. But I do, I think it's really interesting to talk about, there, there is still a huge gap here, right? There's still so much energy being generated from fossil fuels. And I want to ask why that is. 
Part of it is intermittency. And I do have on here that battery prices have also been decreasing precipitously yeah. um, for the past about 20 years or more. They're still a, like too expensive to completely solve the intermittency problem, which is, of course, that you the sun doesn't always shine, wind doesn't always blow. So you need really solid energy storage to be able to re- rely on renewables. That is a, a part of it, a small part of it that's being attacked fiercely right now. Mm-hmm. But a big part of it is called carbon lock-in. So this occurs because carbon generating sources have become so integrated into our systems that one, the cost to produce one more unit of energy at existing coal or oil plants might still be less than the cost of making a whole new renewable energy plant, right? Plus, the C-suite executives of dinosaur utility companies, even if they can make the shift from, from fossil fuels to renewables and have those shifts be profitable, they're just too stuck in the group think to actually believe that. They think it's too much change. They also don't really have the incentive. They're making good profits now. They don't have a strong incentive to switch away from that. And there isn't a government function right now or even a market function at the moment to really make these companies feel the effects of emitting carbon. Yes. Right. Well, that's the thing. Similarly to how before with our healthcare deep dive, we talked about local monopolies with hospitals. Utilities work the same way. Oh, yeah. Utilities are all local companies and often local monopolies if transmission lines aren't built out robustly enough to be able to get energy from different sources. So these utility companies are highly incentivized to lobby to make it really hard to make new energy sources um, or to, to allow new energy sources and to build new transmission lines in their areas of dominance. They do everything they can to make it hard for other companies. I have a great article here from Mother Jones that shows he's been, he's been so excited to read this. Today. Oh my god! That shows exactly how hard this is, or how hard they try to make it hard for other companies. Okay, so let me see. Let me find this. Let me find this specific story. Is that what you have on the sheet? That's part of it, but there's more. Okay. I, I have so much to read here. Okay. 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 So. These companies will go past legal bounds, okay? Something happened in Ohio. In March, a jury found Larry a jury found Larry Householder, the former speaker of the Ohio House, guilty of racketeering and accepting bribes. So, First Energy is a large electric utility based in Ohio. For years it had been trying to collect bailouts for some of its nuclear and coal plants that were struggling to make money. They tried with the Trump administration, and to the Trump administration's credit, they didn't give the bailouts to the Ohio, um, the to First Energy. But First Energy found their guy in Householder. As part of an agreement to avoid trial, First Energy paid the Justice Department $230 million and admitted to all of the following, okay? They routed $61 million through nonprofit groups that don't have to disclose their donors, and First Energy did not have to disclose giving them money. So some of this $61 million was passed to Larry Householder, who used it for personal expenses, hence the bribery charges. But most of the money went during Ohio's 2018 primary season to elect a slate of Republicans who had pledged loyalty to Householder. That's insanity. Dude, it is like it is like high level uh, corruption. Like it is it is textbook corruption. When we okay? talk about the influence of money in politics, there it is, guys. That's all it is. That's all it takes. And so this had specific legislative effects. Householder's payback to First Energy was to pass House Bill 6, which offered over $1 billion in subsidies to First Energy's coal and nuclear plants. Okay? Wow. And that's not all. First Energy also admitted it had paid more than $20 million over 10 years to a guy named Sam Randazzo. $4 million of that came a couple of years ago, just before Randazzo was appointed as First Energy's top regulator on the Public Utilities Commission of Ohio. Oh, my God. So we know that this bribery happened. Um, we know it hasn't only 
that this the bribery money didn't only come from Ohio ratepayers, but also Pennsylvania, New Jersey, West Virginia, and Maryland ratepayers. Oh my god, that's insanity. Okay, but I need to but I need to tell you about one more that I think is even crazier. Okay. So there's there's one more corruption scandal involving utility interventions to elect Republicans in Florida. Florida Power and Lights CEO Eric Salegi unexpectedly announced his early retirement recently. So FPL disputes a lot of this, but it's been reported and it's pretty airtight. They're accused of paying political consultants who then routed money to dark money groups they created for these purposes. Those dark money groups bankrolled unaffiliated independent candidates in state legislative elections who were designed to siphon votes away from candidates disfavored by the utility, who in every case happen to be Democrats. Wait, that's that's insane because I remember during the last election cycle, there were actual like Florida House seats that had the same name as the Democrat as the Democrat um, candidate and they had no name. I mean, I'm sorry, they had the same name as the Democrat candidate, but they had no picture next to their face and that they the votes that went to that independent candidate flipped it from a Democrat seat to a Republican seat. It made the difference. Yeah. Is that what you're about to talk about? That is exactly what I'm about I to saw about. that the night of the election. I was like, what is going on down there? Yeah. In one case, the candidate's main attribute was that they had the same last name as the Democrat. Oh, no. The CEO who resigned had said in an email to two other FPL executives writing about one of the targets who is Jose Javier Rodriguez, I want you to make his life a living hell. And Rodriguez lost re-election by 32 votes. That's literally the person I was taught. That's the person I was looking at that night. I was shocked that this happened. Yeah. Yeah. That's insanity. It is because of a utility company that did this? Yes. These utility companies are insane. It is peak corruption. It's peak corruption. Okay. So these, that's what these fossil fuel companies are doing to hold on to their established power. They are among the top lobbyers and campaign spenders in their states. They will keep playing as bad actors because our rules aren't enforced strictly enough. So take First Energy in Ohio, right? They paid that $230 million fine. The company had $11 billion in revenue in 2021. They don't give a shit about that, that fine. $230 million is like a rounding error to them, okay? So we've talked about this with... Um, I don't remember what we talked about this with, where the the punishment for companies isn't enough we talked about that this with forming unions and mm. many of these cases when the punishment for crimes is just fines a company is going to do a cost benefit analysis yeah and the company is going to see oh wait a second the profit i'm going to make by breaking this law is way more than the fine i'm going to get for breaking it yep. so i'm just going to break the law and pay the fine who cares the exact same problem here no one went to jail they just got fined 230 million and they can write that off easy yeah. Right. Because the profits have already outpaced that 230 million. It's an it's the best investment these guys have ever made is bribing and buying out your politicians. Yeah. And this is one of the things that makes super PACs so dangerous in this country because mm -hmm. because of super PACs, these guys were able to funnel money. OK. Another thing that makes these guys able to funnel money is the money that they're able to accumulate in the first place. Yeah. When people are able to accumulate this much power and this much money, specifically over an industry that is so reliant on the public's trust, mm -hmm. like a utility company, they're going to use every power in their being to make your voice as small and as worthless as possible and buy out the political process in their favor. So they will go to the extent of putting up a fake candidate to to win an election in the worst, most slimy kind of way. Because all they care about is the profit margin. They have no morals. They have no care about the political system. So this is why utilities need to become public. They are the ultimate rent seekers in an economy. Yeah. And rent seekers, to increase their profits, will always try to corrupt the political system to make their rents higher and higher and higher. Because it's the only way that they can truly make more money. They don't have the ability to improve their product and improve their service because they're just rent seekers. Mm -hmm. um, and we need to totally eliminate this type of industry from the private sector and nationalize it entirely. Absolutely. I'm with you. I just I just thought this was crazy. No, that was crazy. It's crazy. crazy. It's crazy that I remember this yeah. happening that night. And it's crazy that this all comes around and a year later, I learn why 
Yeah. You know? And it was this diabolical. And it was this diabolical. This insanity, dude. Absurd. It's Absurd. insanity. It's okay. so depressing. So that's probably, that's my most dramatic reason for why <laughs> we, the transition hasn't been faster. Another huge one is permitting. permitting. Oh, permitting, dude. This is a hard one. You know why this is a hard one? Because it has enemies on the left too. Yeah, because permitting is also the way that liberals slow down fossil fuel projects, right? They ask for environmental reviews, which take, or environmental impact statements, yeah. which take four years on average to produce. So we have this issue and the Biden administration is trying to work on this, but basically any project that uses federal funds must go through reviews and authorizations, um, which are mainly due to federal land use protections. There's dozens of them out there that companies have to cross off. And the problem is these, it's 2023. We have goals set for 2030, for 2050. It takes years to get these up and running. It takes it takes years to pass these permitting requirements. And it takes years more to build these projects, to build these um, facilities and actually start producing the energy. And there's permitting reform. The permitting reform could be a bipartisan accomplishment. Joe Manchin has been leading the charge on permitting reform. Mm -hmm. He wanted to slide it into the Inflation Reduction Act, but he couldn't make it happen. But one of the deals of the Inflation Reduction Act was, okay, Joe Biden and Chuck Schumer, I'll vote for the Inflation Reduction Act. And in return, you build out my Mountain Valley pipeline. That was in the deal. Oh. And you make permitting reform so it's easier to build stuff. That was his deal. Yeah. Now, the permitting reform has not passed because the Democrats in the House didn't go for it. The progressives killed it. Yeah. AOC, Premier Jayapal, they didn't get behind it. Which I, I don't entirely blame them for. I don't either. Because, because it's not guaranteed that, that that renewables will get built on it. No. There's a terrible, terrible fate that could happen if we do permitting reform and the fossil fuel companies still have this much power yeah. that they just decide, eh, screw it. I'm going to go fund this other, I'm going to go fund this new coal plant. Or yes. not coal, but natural gas power. I mean, it could be coal. I mean, the bigger picture here is that uh, renewables are only important because the overall amount of greenhouse gases in the air are what cause climate change, right? So they're important as replacements for these natural gas, for these CO2 emitting uh, fossil fuel facilities. They're not good just because it's good to have more of them. They're only good because it means we can take away the fossil fuels. Yes. Um, so permitting is tough. I, I mean, tough, but not that tough if you have enough progressives in government. You can definitely find a way to in, install some language in these bills to say, it's gonna, we're going to make it easier to permit for renewables. Yeah, I mean, if you, can, if, you can make it, if you can make a progressive government, yeah. If you can make a progressive coalition big enough, I would love to see that. Yeah. The issue is if you've got to work with a guy like Joe Manchin, what do we do then? Yes. You know, and that, that's what just makes it hard. The math just gets hard. Yes, totally. Totally. So that, that focus, that was a little bit of a focus of like why it's hard in the U.S. I want to talk a little bit about China. And then I, I can I want to hand it over to you soon because I've been talking for no, but I think I'm going to be able to jump in here when you talk about China. For beautiful, a second. beautiful. Okay, so China is important to focus on because they're the biggest emitter in the world by far. They emitted more greenhouse gases than the U.S., Europe, and Japan combined in 2022. I okay. will. I don't want to you know defend China here, but it's not per capita. No. But per capita, the United States is still the largest emitter. Very true. Very true. Uh, but per capita, but because China has such a large population, they're extremely important to yes. our battle. So the weird thing about China is they are still the biggest renewable producer in the world. They lead the world in renewables installation. But like we just said, if they're also burning more and more fossil fuels, that doesn't matter. That doesn't matter at all. Okay, so we need to keep our eye on the ball there. In recent years... China's fossil fuel burning has gone up, and specifically, their coal burning. Their coal burning has gone through the roof in some areas, man. Yeah, because they've been very reliant on. I think they've been very reliant. They've been very reliant on coal imported from Australia. They've coal, been very reliant. on Yes, that. and and oil and natural gas imported from other countries as well. Yes, and so what happened is China, China has faced some energy shortages in recent years. I can read off a few here. During the winter of 2017 through 2018, natural gas production problems in Turkmenistan sparked a minor crisis in mm -hmm. Chinese electricity markets, 
Russia's maintenance of a natural gas pipeline in October of 2022 raised eyebrows in Beijing, and they were a little bit worried about what might be going on there. Um, they, they import a bunch of natural gas from the U.S. still, and Beijing is skeptical about that source. So there are a bunch of places, and of course, the, the importation of Australian coal. There are a bunch of places that they're just not sure that they're going to be able to keep getting energy from. And since China is still dealing with the intermittency problem with with renewable sources like everywhere else, it's like we need to have enough of our own coal and enough of our own facilities to dig up coal whenever we need it Mm -hmm. to be able to be energy secure, to not have these massive blackouts and shortages at certain times. Well, China could also, like, I think China's also thinking about this from a green perspective, saying we can achieve energy independence by going green. I think that's definitely a political debate going on in there right yeah. now, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, that's part of it. They are trying to go green, but they they can't completely. Right. Because the sun doesn't always shine. No, you're right. Because they're still f- having the latency problem. Yeah. Now, a part of the Paris Agreement was that China agreed to level its carbon emissions at the year 2030. Mm-hmm. So they are going to, they're, they're, it is already written in that China is going to increase its carbon emissions until the year 2030 and then start cutting them. That's a part of the Paris deal. Okay. Uh, yeah. China, for example, committed to leveling off its carbon emissions no later than 2030. Okay. Here's my issue, guys. Since the year 2015, the rate in which China has increased its fossil fuel uh, and carbon emissions has only increased. It has only increased since the Paris Climate Accord. That's the rate. That's the rate. So it's exponential. No, not exponentially, but it's the like the it, it's second order increase. Yes, it is. It, it's second order increase is going hard. Twenty twenty two is not well. Ben, you want to look at the chart for me? Can you oh see? yeah. Oh, yeah. I see what you're looking. Okay. At. Yeah. So th- yeah. that's insanity, and it does not look like China is leveling off anytime soon. No. There are differences. European Union has not only leveled off. They are drastically reducing. They topped off around 4 billion um, metric tons of CO2 emissions in the 1970s and are now below 3 billion metric tons. Mm -hmm. Okay. The United States, for all the shit we give our government for not radically attacking climate change is all of it deserves. The United States has peaked its carbon emissions in in 2005, around over 6 billion. Now we are down to 5 billion emissions. The United States peaked their carbon emissions in 2005 at over 6 billion metric tons of CO2. Now, the United States in 2021 has emitted 5 billion metric tons of CO2, and it has only decreased in the next two years. And that puts us at around the level of what we were producing in the 1970s. So we have done a fairly good job. Yeah. Okay. And now, as a part of the parent cli- uh, as a part of the Paris Climate Accord, Accord, the United States has committed to cutting overall greenhouse gases emissions by 26 to 28 percent below the 2005 levels by 2025. Well, bad news. Currently, we have gone from 600 6.14 billion to 5 billion metric tons of CO2, which is only an 18 percent reduction so far. We only have a year left. To make it 2025. We won't. We won't hit it. Um, we might get close. We might hit that 23 number. That's possible. The permitting. The permitting. No, no, no. But this is also 2021 data. Okay. Right? We don't know 2022 and 2023 yet. Okay. I'm. If you maybe, can find it. Be, if I can find 2022 at least. Yeah, at least find 2022. This is, this is just total emissions? Yeah, total, total emissions. Total CO2 emissions. Now, the United States has made a lot of progress in the last year here by passing the Inflation Reduction Act, which is the next thing we're going to be talking about. So with the Inflation Reduction Act, this will be able to cut economy-wide carbon emissions by up to 43% by 2030. Now, that's really good to see if we can keep that cut of 43% by 2030, okay? Um, Specifically, in the electric power sector, the EPA said that emissions could be reduced by up to 83% below the 2005 levels. That's big. That's big, but... We are not on track with the Paris Climate Accord right now. No. The IRA could put us closer to it. Um, It probably won't get us closer to that 2025 number, but we might reach these goals in 2027, which I want the United States to be a player and an example on the international stage for the world to follow. Yes. You know? Yes. We should be the leader. The fact that the the EU is is beating us by so much in its own 
decline is uh, frustrating. Well, there's a lot of reasons why the EU is be beating us. And one of them is the presence of carbon taxes. If you might, can I move over to carbon tax? Please. Okay. So there are other ways that we ha we can deal with climate change. There are two of them. It's the first that we, and both, one of them we have tried in the United States, the other one we haven't. So a carbon tax. What is a carbon tax? A carbon tax is a tax levied on the carbon content of fossil fuels. The term can also refer to taxing other types of greenhouse gas emissions such as methane. But a carbon tax specifically puts a price on those emissions to encourage consumers, businesses, and governments to produce less of them. So this is what we were saying before with that utility company. These guys have no incentive to switch from fossil fuels to to renewable energies but if we put a carbon tax on them and we made carbon more expensive in the market maybe they would finally switch over now the issue with the carbon tax and one of the issues i have is that lower income households which spend a larger share of their income on emissions intensive goods and services will see a larger impact due to carbon taxes mm. there's no doubt it's a regressive tax at its core okay but it depends what you do with the revenue of carbon tax which actually makes it regressive Aggressive. It depends how you spend that carbon tax money. There's three things that re that experts say you're able to do with this. Okay. Pair the carbon taxes with large lump sum rebates. Give the money back to people, right? Okay. Um, this will greatly impact employment, but will hurt GDP negatively and will make the tax code, but will make the taxes more progressive. Okay. Okay. Then the next one, you can pair it with a cut in the employment in the employee side payroll tax, lower your social security and lower your Medicare tax by funding it through carbon taxes and by funding social security and Medicare also through carbon taxes. This will increase progressivity, GDP and employment. That's like almost best, best of both worlds. I guess, but uh, I mean, we already need more tax money to pay for those services. So I feel like we couldn't really feasibly lower the taxes we already have agreed and then there's the worst case scenario paired with a cut in the corporate income tax and imp an increase r d expe uh increase r d spending this will boost gdp um and pre-tax wages but will lessen the productivity and lower and lower employment but lower the progressivity of the taxes point is carbon taxes aren't that popular because of all the reasons i said they aren't very progressive they're regressive yeah they hit the poorest the most um but they are effective. A 2017 study estimates a tax of $49 per metric ton of carbon dioxide could raise about $2.2 trillion in net revenue over 10 years from 2019 to 2028. That's how much money we could be making off these carbon taxes. So it's extremely effective at funding the government. Uh, and in reducing and, emissions? And then and so does it work? with reducing emissions. Well, we can see what they did in Europe. Mm -hmm. We have found that cumulative reduction in an order of 4 to 6% for a $40 ton of carbon tax. So 4 to 6% reduction in emissions for a $40 per ton of CO2. Does that make sense? Yes. So yes, it reduces emissions greatly. If you could see the chart, um, again, uh, we're going to make a Patreon at some point. And if you give us money, we'll put charts on the screen. Yeah. So that'd be a big deal. Um, but yeah. the chart shows a high, yeah, a, there's a good correlation between the carbon tax and a decrease in fossil fuel emissions. I love that. I know. I love it too, man. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's the stick side, right? This let's, is the stick side. Let's hit people for using carbon. Let's, that's the other way to drive adoption of renewables. Yeah. But it's not the total stick side because there's an even stickier side. Mm. There's, there's a mace side. Ooh. Okay. Um, tradable pollution permits. Tradable pollution permits are similar to carbon taxes, but they're not. If you watched a lot of news during the Obama administration, you would know these as cap and trade. Okay. okay. So tradable permits um, are a market-based solution to emission control and reduction. Carbon permits markets, carbon permit markets works on a cap and trade principle where the government or the appointed agencies set targets for allowed pollution and industries then bid on the permits that allow them to do the emissions. Hmm. So the company is, yes. So, so say like there is a permit that allows you one metric ton of carbon dioxide of one of carbon dioxide. Okay. That goes on the market. Now companies say, oh man, I need to buy this so I can then 
produce thing emit carbon dioxide okay so then bidding wars start and then there becomes a natural price of these carbon permits sure and then that incentivizes companies who own permits to then sell permits to companies that companies if you own a permit and you don't use it you can then make money by selling that permit to somebody who does need it to emit things and it's encouraging everyone to lower their overall emittance yeah because they don't want to have to pay this extra cost in their cost of doing business i like that a lot yes first question Mm -hmm. enforcement mechanism is there one? Do you have any idea what it is? I have no idea what the enforcement mechanism is, but there is one baked into the EPA because this isn't the first. T- this isn't the first time the United States has done this. Okay. The EPA has already done a cap and trade solution with sulfur dioxide, oh. which I'll talk about in a second. Okay. So most polluting firms. This is what I just talked about, but I want to give a better breakdown from the article directly, not just me. The most polluting firms will enter the emissions trading market as buyers, and those firms that pollute below their levels can sell their surplus permits. This then forces the polluter to internalize the externality. This is what we talked about before. Companies do not feel the direct effects of carbon emissions, so there's no reasons for them to take it into account in their balance sheet. Mm -hmm. But if we now force the polluter to internalize this grander grander humanitarian externality in their in their balance sheets, now we might see some transition. So over time, polluting firms become less competitive because they have a higher cost of doing business with the non-polluting firms becoming more competitive. This process continues so that the industry slowly moves from a polluting industry into a greener one. So that's cap and trade. I do really like the idea. Um, And I can think of legislation right now where you set a number of permits that you're going to sell say in year 2024 Mm -hmm. and then you can set a rate for the next 10 years how are they going to decrease yeah right slowly so companies have to know and understand how to make this transition and they can make it very they they, it can be very planned because you can say okay guys these are the permits that we're going to set out over the next 10 years Mm -hmm. be ready for it but what's the difference between this and a carbon tax because initially i'm reading this they seem very similar Mm -hmm. right I, I I didn't understand the difference yet. Carbon tax puts a price on carbon. Cap and trade puts a price on carbon. What's the difference here? Well, here's the difference. A carbon tax and cap and trade are opposite sides of the same coin. A carbon tax sets the price of carbon dioxide emissions and allows the market to determine the quantity of emission reductions. Cap and trade sets the quantity of emission reductions and lets the market determine the price of carbon. Yep. I get that. What a fantastic... I read that article. I'm like, oh my God, this makes so much sense. Yeah, perfect. Click. Perfect connection here. So uh, the United States has had a history with cap and trade, and it was extremely effective. So uh, during the 1990s, we had a big problem with acid rain, and it was caused by a lot of sulfur dioxide in the atmosphere, SO2. So um, at, under Title IX of the 1990 Clean Air Amendment, Title IV, Title IV, Geez, I'm a Star Wars fan. You think I know that? Yeah, honestly. Um, of the 1990 Clean Air Amendments, um, the CO2. Uh, sorry, there was a allowance trading program established for sulfur dioxide, and it was the first large-scale pollutant cap and trade system in the world. America used to be a leader on stuff like this. Not anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, The stated purpose of the acid rain program was to reduce total SO2 emissions in the U.S. by 10 million tons relative to 1980. By 2007, annual emissions had declined below the program's 9 million ton goal, a 43% reduction from the 1990 levels, despite electricity generation from coal-fired power plants increasing more than 26% between 1990 and 2007. So sulfur dioxide came from dirty carbon. So what happened was, okay, you put a price on dirty carbon. Okay, we're going to go to clean carbon. And you can hear a lot of times, you heard Trump on the campaign trail talking about, we want clean coal. It didn't make much sense to me. Well, that's what he's talking about with clean coal. Mm -hmm. He's talking about low sulfur coal, which is more expensive than dirty coal. But because of the cap and trade stuff that was baked in, it became more expensive to use the dirty coal. That's what we can do with carbon. Yes. That's what we can do with carbon. It's what we probably need to do with carbon. Issue. Issue. Because cap and trade sets the quantity, not the price of carbon, government planners might set the quantity of carbon that is possible too low. It might be possible that we set the carbon level too low for industry to handle, yeah. and, we have, and we have total energy problems. Of course. If we have the carbon tax, we put the price on carbon, companies pay it, 
and then the quantity gets evened out. But then the, the issue there is, did we set the price of carbon too low or too high to incentivize the right change? Yeah, I mean, I think you know where I'm going to fall on this. We need the forcing solution. Wow, you, so you're going on the stick. Normally, you're carrot. You're normally the carrot guy. I mean, I want both. Okay. And I mean, yeah, you want the IRA and you want the cap and trade. Of course, of course. But I, I, I don't want to risk just having the rich be like, okay, we can just... We just keep emitting, right? We can afford the carbon tax. Right. Like, I don't want the gradual uh, shift from the carbon tax to to move the economy a little bit. I want to say, this is all we can do. This is all we're allowing you to do, okay? And it's going to get less and less, and we know that it's going to get less and less at this rate. And that's why you asked me about the enforcement mechanism. Well, during the Obama administration, uh, he tried cap and trade, and it didn't work. Industry didn't take it. It got fought in the courts. Okay. And there was a lot of issues. Cap and trade has had a lot of issues in the courts since the 80s and the 90s and the 2000s. Okay. I'm curious about what specifically those are. I can't tell you because I, I, I already went too deep here. Yeah, I know. Myself. No, that's fine. But I'm I'm guessing it's not constitutional. Maybe it's constitutional. No, I think it's constitutional, just not, just not done on, under current statute because he tried to do it under executive authority. So I think he's trying to apply the cap and trade system in that was done for the SO2 sure. and then apply it to CO2. My my point being, statute could enable it. Statute could enable it. And yes. I think I'm in favor of it. I think I am in favor of the cap and trade system in combination with incentives. Yeah, it's, it's another one of those things where, yes, like almost everything we talk about, if you go too far, it's a problem. But at least with the current administration, it seems like we have some pretty good analysts working on these things to figure out what the right amount on the spectrum mm -hmm. would be for cap and trade. Absolutely. And I think we need to work as hard as we can to attack that. What I'm also thinking is maybe you could you could make it even more specific about what industries, I mean, I think you even said this, what industries are you capping and, yep. and by how much, right? More necessary industries, you can have higher caps, so there's a little bit more wiggle room. But Beautiful. things like, I don't know, alcohol production if they're emitting carbon you can force them to emit less carbon than you would force other that's a little harder now emit. because now what you just said is breaking the notion of cap and trade because Why? the point the 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 philosophy which i agree with you i agree with what you just said sure but the but the philosophy behind cap and trade is a market-based solution mm -hmm. and the companies that need carbon the most will be the ones to purchase it on the open market and determine the price of carbon. Mm -hmm. So we, it's going to be hard to then make this open marketplace of carbon permits mm. and then say, okay, we have an open market for carbon permits, but if you're an alcohol distillery, you pay a 20% premium on all your purchases off this open market. What about insular markets by industry? That is interesting. I think that's a great. I think that's a great idea. But now you're now you're getting even harder. Yes. Now you're saying that. Yes. The, now you're saying that the government planners need to be able to permit the correct number of CO two to not just the overall general economy, but now to each specific industry. True. And those carbon permits can't cross into other industry sectors. Yes. So that's even harder. Yes. Admittedly. Yes. Okay. That's even harder. Yeah. You see what I mean? I do. And that's where, like, I don't know. We probably would need to do several weeks of research of data to analysis this out. Yeah. yeah to understand whether that's possible people get paid probably full-time wages to figure out what we're talking about totally here. but it's yeah. but yeah that's why we're the idea guys that's why we should be like elected as the high level officials and the president and we'd be like that's a good idea go figure it out yeah yeah and i also i love figuring it out listen you know me guys i i got that masters of math i did that awesome breakdown of the of the jobs thing the other day i love that but i just don't have the time yeah <laughs> i don't no. have the time no nor do i um, but so cap and trade, I think it's a really, really interesting idea. I agree. Um, and it's not as, uh, regressive as carbon taxes. No, 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 no. Right. No. It that, falls much more on the companies. Much more on the companies. Yeah. Much more on the companies. Um, but now let's get into what the United States has done as of late. Cause I think this is what's the really exciting stuff. I want to talk, let's talk about the effects of the IRA. So okay. you start off and then I'll, uh, make some additions wherever I find necessary. Sure. So generally... Of course, it's important to subsidize renewable projects, just like I just talked about with the prices, with the cost of solar and wind going down. That happened because early on in those processes, the government subsidized research that went into 
making them cheaper and cheaper in the manufacturing. So since the IRA is happening now, even though the cost curve now has brought solar and wind underneath natural gas, coal, and oil, it's going to drive implementation of these plants that much faster. And it's going to drive our learning curve, like our learning rate, that much harder. So in its first year, the Inflation Reduction Act has led to companies announcing over $110 billion in clean energy manufacturing investments, including $10 billion in solar manufacturing. I'm going wow. to point out right now, $70 billion of that is in the EV supply chain, and that's probably going to be our next deep dive, which is also awesome. It's created more than 170,000 new clean energy jobs already. And over the next seven years, we expect twice as much solar, wind, and battery deployment as we would have had without it. It's insanity. There are $216 billion worth of tax credits baked in for corporations to receive. Mm -hmm. But as we've talked about, that number can go way up if the demand is there. Yeah. It really isn't that hard of a cap on it. No. Right? That was just what they expected the the market would ask for. Mm -hmm. But we're seeing that very much outpaced. Mm -hmm. The IRA also not just incentivizes uh, the clean energy production in corporations, it also uh, uh, incentivizes and subsidizes the consumer's adoption of renewable energy technology. In the IRA, there are $43 billion in tax credits aimed to lower the emissions by making electric vehicles energy efficient appliances, rooftop solar panels, geothermal heating, and home batteries. That's awesome. This is designed to make it more affordable on the consumer end, on your end, on my end, on our end. Mm -hmm. So this is some of those subsidies. $2,000 per year customer uh, consumer tax credit for the purchase of a heat pump, $30 per milliwatt hour for zero carbon electricity generation, $15 $15 per hour megawatt per, um, yeah, sorry, $15 per megawatt hour for power production from nuclear facilities, $4,000 per vehicle for EVs, $1.75 per gallon for production of mixture of sustainable aviation fuel. That's probably only that, uh, uh, unless you're a private jet owner, you're probably not thinking about that. Yeah. Um, and then $3 per kilogram for the production of qualified clean hydrogen. So, you're going to be affected by this at the end of tax season. And you're if you do these electric vehicle and green energy improvements to your home, you're going to see that money in your pocketbook. That's several thousands of dollars, legitimately. And it's it's amazing. Yeah. It's absolutely incredible. It actually, like, as you read that off, I was thinking, maybe I should reach out to my landlord. Like, see if he could get this happening at my apartment. True. Wait a second. Yeah. What's the, what do you think the cost would be to implement a heat pump in some of these buildings? Probably less than, I mean, the question is they're just passing the cost on the renters. Yeah, but that's right? fine. So, it would be cheaper than what we have now, probably. Yeah. After this, uh, well, maybe not. I don't know. I don't know what it would be like. I don't either. But that is a good, that is a good mindset. I like that. Yeah. Um, in addition to all this amazing stuff that it's doing on the consumer end, on the demand end and on the supply end, it's also doing a lot on the intellectual end. Um, to help build stronger, more diverse science, technology, and engineering, and math, STEM talent, um, the manufacturing facilities are only eligible for full IRA tax credits if they meet prevailing wage and apprenticeship requirements. That's what I love to see. But I wish there was just one more comma. Collective bargaining rights. I wish <laughs> there was just one more in there. Yeah. You know, we got so close. We met so close with the prevailing wage and the apprenticeship requirements. I wish we could have just said open to unionized workforces, right? Yeah. Again, n- not unlimited money. Not unlimited money. But I hear you. Yeah. Yeah. I know liberal little you. A liberal me, baby. Everything. Liberal, big, capital L, liberal, New Deal, Democrat me. Yeah. Um, but dude, God, dude, like I know it's very easy to doom and gloom on climate change. But honestly, after reading this, I don't know if I felt a lot of doom and gloom. No, I felt I felt more excited. I, st- I feel more in the middle, I think. Yeah, because we're already we're already over one degree of warming. Like we're already in the range for some of these climate tipping points. I am still scared, but I'm really encouraged by how well these global communities are actually coalescing and paying attention to how big of a problem this is and attacking it. They are, and They're they are taking it seriously. It. I wish that there was, 
This is a hard truth. We lost a lot of valuable time by electing Trump. Those four years, we lost a lot of time. Yeah. We can't make that mistake again, guys. We cannot. No. Um, We'll talk about this more as the election season gets hotter, but we cannot make the mistake of electing somebody who thinks climate change is a hoax. The the, the world cannot afford it. No, we're actually really, like, honestly, until if we ever get out of the climate change woods, until then... We, we literally can't afford electing a Republican. No, it's, it's Unless not. this becomes like part of, like bipartisan, mm-hmm. we, uh, right. until, it's life or death. Until the Republicans can get on board with something like the Inflation Reduction Act, they, they are not reliable partners in this fight. Yeah. And because of Donald Trump, we missed our Paris Climate Agreement goals. The Inflation Reduction Act is trying its best to get us back on there mm-hmm. and maybe reach the right rate or meet us or, or get us where we need to be by 2027 maybe, right? But the fact that we made that mistake by electing Donald Trump set us back so huge far. Huge setback. It's a huge setback and it made us unserious to the rest of the world on this fight. Yeah. This is why the EU is beating us by so much. It's why the EU is beating us so much. And it, I, and I, the next thing is we just got to take on China. We need to take on China. Yeah. We we kind of, we need to convince, the China problem is so interesting because our tension with them is causing this. Like this is because they're being more isolated from the global system. That's why they're feeling less secure about their energy. That's why they're feeling the need to dig up all this coal and why they're burning so much of it when they can't produce their energy in uh, with all of their renewables. And I think that's why Biden, whenever he goes on TV, he never says that the U.S. is decoupling from China. Even mm-hmm. though we can see it in all the data, he never says it. Yep. It's, he never says decoupling. It's why the U.S. climate envoy John Kerry recently made a visit there because we see how important they are. This We cannot leave them out of this, right? Like, like climate change is a global phenomenon. So we can't... This, it's it's hard to kind of balance competition, but also like China is like like you said before, it's beneficial for them to transfer to to transition to clean energy. It is. It's in their interest. They don't want to be relying on imports through the Strait of Malacca or from coal from Australia, which is a very hard U.S. ally. They don't want that. Plus, they're the biggest producer of the technology, right? Mm-hmm. So this is a way to make the rest of the world more dependent on them and to have big income streams from exports. How do you feel about Nikki Haley's criticism of the Inflation Reduction Act by saying we're subsidized Chinese production? We talked about this a little bit. I think it's it's completely accurate. It's a poignant criticism. Um, but I think it's okay. Right. It's okay for where we're at right now. Yeah. And it also shows, I think it does something to show that the Chinese, like to the Chinese government that, you know, uh, we have our disagreements, but we're going to fight climate change and it's okay if you profit off of it because we need to get this done. Yeah. Well, to be honest, it's- but, but we're also encouraging solar production in the U.S. through the Inflation Reduction Act now. So that could change, right? Yes. But we're not always going to be relying on China for the technology because of Joe Biden and the Democrat economic policies. We are going to become green energy efficient down the line. But just for right now, we're still relying on some Chinese input products. Yeah. I mean, honestly, they, they really do have dominance over the supply chain. So it's going to be a relatively slow build out as to onshoring and nearshoring manufacturing of those solar cells. But this is one of those things where until they do invade Taiwan, let's keep buying. Absolutely. We okay. got to do it. As long as we can, this is more important. Let's keep buying. It's just like Germany with Russia, right? Once once Russia invaded Ukraine, they were like, ah, fuck, we can't keep buying their oil, their gas, except right now we need to keep buying their gas. So let's keep buying their gas, but now really put the pedal to the metal as hard as we can to build out our own energy production. Right. And that was the German mistake that we won't repeat. German beca- Germany became reliant on Russia for their energy needs mm-hmm. because they thought it would make a good uh, geopolitical partnership. Mm-hmm. It didn't. They messed up and they got screwed because they didn't have anything in the pipeline and they had to start opening up coal plants in order to you know, keep their lights on. Yes. The U.S. isn't making that mistake. We are going to say, okay, China, we're going to keep buying from you. We, we know that you are a geopolitical competition. We're going to keep buying from you. But also, we're going to do massive government subsidies into our own local production so eventually we don't have to buy so much from you. Exactly. Exactly. This was my favorite episode we've ever done. I had a great time. I had a great time, man.